Hello, everyone, and welcome to the National Museum of Civil War Medicine's live stream with our friend Rich Condon. Rich, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Uh, as before, uh, I'm Kyle. I'll be kind of the producer today. I'm the membership and development coordinator for the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, glad to have you all with us today. But the real host is uh, our executive director, head honcho himself, David Price. Hey, everybody. Good to have you, Rich. Glad to be here. Now, we'll get into uh, all the fun stuff we've got to talk about today, some really intriguing and fascinating topics. Uh, but before we do that, we got a couple of housekeeping things to check off real quick. Uh, first of all, uh, this is a nonprofit. We are a private nonprofit, uh, happy to work with, the, with Rich from the National Park Service. Uh, but our institution is a private nonprofit, and that means that we are very reliant on support. If you like this video and other videos on our channel, please consider supporting us. You do that in the linked comment comment below. Members are our real uh, supporters, are the best advocates for us. Uh, you get some great benefits out of that as well. 10% off in our gift shop, at least 10%. Uh, you get a subscription to our journal, our newsletter. Uh, it's just a real good deal all around, plus free admittance to all of our museums, all three museums, for a full year. So please consider that uh, if you like our videos, if you're already a member, thank you. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. You're the reason that we survive and thrive. Uh, another brief note that we'd like to put before all of our videos, uh, we're not going to get into too much like real nitty gritty medical stuff here. We're going to be talking a lot about hospitals, about personal experiences. But when we do talk about medicine, bear in mind that none of us are doctors. We are not medical professionals of any sort. Uh, nothing we say should be taken as medical advice. Uh, please talk to your actual doctor for that, not a bunch of historians. Uh, so please bear that in mind. Uh, with all that said, I'm going to pass it on to, uh, oh, actually, there is one more thing. Uh, for those of you dropping comments, I can see them. Rich and David cannot. So I will be popping on occasionally, but ask questions as we go. Feel free to ask any question you have. We'll do our best to answer. Um, but Rich and David can't see them. Only I can. I'll be doing a lot of behind the scenes stuff, and I'll try to get to all of your questions as we go. Uh, so again, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. I'm going to pass it off to David now. All right, thank you, Kyle, and thank you, everybody watching. Um, Rich, you know, uh, you, you, we had you here up in our area for a while because you went to Shepherd University with uh, um, Dr. James Brumall, one of our dear friends of our play, our, our museum here, and great supporter. And then, how did you end up down in South Carolina? And more importantly, um, tell us a little bit about the unique park kind of setup that you have. It, it's a little different than what we're used to dealing with, you know, specific geographic areas on one battle. Yeah, so um, it was kind of a long and circuitous route uh, to get down here. Uh, of course, you know, 2017, 2018, I was up in Maryland and in West Virginia, uh, of course, going to Shepherd University. Um, I worked with you all for a little bit at the museum. And then I got my first a little bit, maybe yeah. about a day and a half. Not um, long enough, not long enough as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but then I uh, I accepted my first position with the National Park Service um, at Flight 93 National Memorial in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, which was only about an hour and a half from my hometown of Pittsburgh. So I I couldn't really turn that down, but that was, that was my foot in the door um, getting into the National Park Service. Uh, I worked there for from 2018 to, to 2019, and then, of course, in early 2020, uh, as, as the pandemic was starting to get underway, I was offered this position far, far away from the city um, and near the beach. So, it, you know, I, I couldn't really say no to that. Um, and, uh, and of course, what we talk about here at this particular park at Reconstruction Air National Historical Park uh, is, is up my alley. I mean, my background is in Civil War and Reconstruction, so this worked out perfectly. Um, you know, the, the story that we talk about here is um, reconstruction across the board, across the United States, but using what happens in this particular area as kind of a jumping off point to discuss that story. Um, reconstruction began here uh, on the South Carolina Sea Islands in 1861 and lasted all the way to about 1900. Um, yeah. So it starts earlier and, and lasts longer than most places across the country. So you're really interpreting, you know, decades, not just the four or five years uh, around the Civil War. And then more importantly, what it looks like to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, 
you know, we're operating three sites here, which is a challenge enough. The Pry House on Antietam, Clara Barton in downtown DC, uh, and then our main museum in Frederick. And, and we try to combine that whole story. You've got the storyline of reconstruction and you have sort of a loose, you, how, how many sites or areas are you and your, your team there interpreting? And then you've got a broader network, it looks like, uh, of a reconstruction story. So the, the the physical resources that we have to work with here are, I mean, of course, we have stuff from the late 19th century, but a lot of what we have, uh, these resources are from the Civil War era, um, because Reconstruction starts during the Civil War. Um, you know, we, we discuss that heavily. Um, and of course, that's what we're going to talk about today. Some of these, these Civil War slash early Reconstruction hospitals that we have around the town of, of Beaufort. Um, within the park itself, we actually have three sites as well. Um, so right now I'm at, uh, at our main visitor center, downtown Beaufort, right across from the Beaufort Arsenal building. Um, we have a site out on St. Helena Island, which is just a couple of miles away um, at the site of, of uh, Penn Center. Um, our little visitor center out there is called Dara Hall. Um, but in the larger picture, that is the site of one of the first Freedmen's schools established here. In 1862. Cool. Um, and then the, the third site is actually in Port Royal, where I live, just a couple of miles south of Beaufort, same island, um, the site of Camp Saxton, which was the first training ground and recruiting facility for African American soldiers during the Civil War. Awesome. In 1862 as well. Yeah. So we, we kind of approach Reconstruction from a bunch of different angles, whether it be um, this idea of military service leading to citizenship or um, you know, land and, and labor reform, uh, things of that sort. And of course, education is a big one too. So I know, you know, we're the, our story is, of course, the medical one. And, um, you know, you've got a whole bunch of hospitals down there because uh, your area was occupied almost from the beginning of the war, correct? So they had time to organize these things. So, right. you know, it's, just show us some of that stuff. Show us about the hospitals and who they were caring for because they, they as you're describing it, uh, with colored troops and with contraband and freed slaves and freed populations, it was it was a unique challenge compared to the story we are, usually tell, which is um, you know emphasized on the battlefield relief of it. But you're you're going to have civilian impact, popula different population impact. Um, so so what do you got down there? So I like to I often compare what's happening in Beaufort and and the Sea Islands as a whole. Um, to what's happening in, say, Nashville uh, from 1862 onward or yeah. uh, Washington, D.C., because um, you not only have battlefield casualties, uh, but, of course, a lot of the people that are in these hospitals are are sick. Um, you know, when you have thousands upon thousands of people uh, congregating in this one small area coming from not only cities from across the north or, or small towns from across the north, but people from the sea islands are going to have disease running rampant. Um, you not only have the hospitals um, that are established in buildings, you know, these, these brick and mortar uh, hospitals, but you also have uh, quote unquote contraband camps or refugee camps uh, as well, all over the place. You know, this area, these sea islands, um, you know, you have 85 to 90% of the population that's uh, enslaved African-Americans. That's about 10,000 people in, say, 1861. That number grows over time by 1865 to about triple that number. Yeah, that was going to be my kind of my next question is, you know, we, we talk about different towns, particularly Frederick, uh, Franklin, Tennessee, you know, Shepherdstown um, becoming one vast hospital. So how, how big of an increase in population? I'm assuming once once these hospitals were set up and, and services and things that there was an influx from other areas. Did Was that the case? And, and how big was that to where they had to, their infrastructure that has existed had to deal with all these incoming immigrations? Right. So um, kind of backing up a little bit, uh, what where this all spurs from is actually uh, U.S. occupation or, or liberation in November of 1861, just a couple months after the war starts. Uh, and that's why we start Reconstruction in 1861. Um, you know, th this is military emancipation that results in reconstruction here. So in November of 61, U.S. troops arrive, almost 13,000 of them, 
on about 77 ships that departed from Hampton Roads, Virginia. And, you know, of course, they drive out all the white plantation owners here um, and, you know, all the Confederate troops that are occupying uh, the area as well, which include two forts that defended Port Royal Harbor. Uh, on November 7th, 1861, in a matter of four hours, uh, that U.S. fleet basically levels the forts, drives all the Confederates out of the area. And by end of day of November 7th, U.S. soldiers are setting foot on the sands of Hilton Head Island. Okay. And so, you know, almost immediately they're being greeted by freed African-Americans. Eventually, uh, thousands of them are, are coming from all over the islands to see what's going on. Um, it's a day that's forever remembered as the, the day of the big gun shoot. Huh. Um, and so, uh, you know, of course, the military um, was not necessarily prepped for this situation. This is not something they factored into a military campaign. And so they have to figure out quickly, OK, what do we what do we do now? How, how do we how do we establish some kind of infrastructure here? How do we get people things like uh, an education, medical care, things like that? And so quickly, they start to pull together resources. And uh, by early 1862, um, they're going to start working with Freedmen's Aid Societies from places like Philadelphia, New York City, Boston. Um, so by the spring of 62, they start to send dozens of uh, missionaries, doctors, nurses, et cetera, from those cities. And this place starts to transform rapidly. I mean, all, all the homes in downtown Buford are now being repurposed by the, the U.S. military um, of course, you need a, a commissary department to keep everyone fed. You need a quartermaster's department to keep everyone supplied. Um, and of course, they're going to eventually have 15 U.S. Army hospitals set up in downtown Beaufort. Um, in addition to, of course, there's an, uh, an officer's hospital and a hospital for refugees. Was there is there an identifiable, identifiable guy who was put in charge of that organization or were they just winging it? So in the... Uh, Summer of 1862, um, there will be a, a head surgeon. Um, oh, his last name was Crane. Uh, Dr. Crane. Hold on, I have it written down somewhere. <laughs> well, um, I was just, I was asking because, you know, we talk about Letterman in the context that he right. order out of chaos, and I just didn't know if there was an equivalent down there. There was, there was this Dr. Crane that basically became the uh, lead surgeon for the Department of the South. The Military Department of the South is established about the same time that these missionaries are starting to come down here. Um, so he's, of course, kind of heading up the, the the medical side of things, but you also have somebody in charge of all the nurses here, um, uh, Jean Davenport Lander. She's actually a former actress um, <laughs> who really didn't have a whole lot of medical experience uh, prior to coming to the Low Country. Um, but about that same time in the summer of 1862, she's overseeing the nurses' operation. And kind of breaking it down from there, um, regimental surgeons will be taking care of each hospital that's established here. Gotcha. While that's we're cool. on the topic of um, people who are helping, um, oh, we did get a question in the comments from Anna. Anna, thank you for submitting your question. Was there much pushback from the white military doctors about treating newly freed men and women? I, I haven't uh, come across any accounts off the top of my head uh, about doctors treating freed people. Um, you know, I actually had this conversation with a, a colleague the other day. Um, this, what's going to be referred to as the Port Royal experiment. You know, when you think of an experiment, you think trial and error. Well, that's, that's how the government saw everything that was going on here. Um, what's going on could be a complete success or an utter failure in their eyes. Um, part of that is... Um, you know, having the right people in place for this to be a success. So if you were to have, you know, a, a commander of the Department of the South who um, isn't necessarily an abolitionist or doesn't have freed people's best interest in mind, this could have been something totally different. Um, this might not have laid the groundwork for reconstruction. But because you have someone like, say, David Hunter, an ardent abolitionist from New York in charge, um, as well as other uh, abolish, abolitionists kind of at the head level, they're inviting other abolitionists from the North to come down and actually make this a success. Does that mean everybody that comes down here is an abolitionist? No. Um, but a majority of the people who are kind of uh, pulling the strings are, are do have the, the free people's interests in mind. Cool, cool. 
So I know you've got a uh, you know good information on these actual hospital sites and the and the treasure that you uh, are able to be around is the fact that a lot of them still stand, right. which is super cool. So tell us tell us a little bit about the organization of how many hospitals there were, and I'm assuming they're the majority are all downtown in a condensed area, or were they spread out a little bit? They're they're spread out throughout the downtown area, but you know downtown Beaufort in in 1861 62 is not a a huge area like like it is today. Um, so you know you could realistically today walk a few blocks and see all the hospitals. Well, that's cool. I think I think out of the 15 U.S. Army hospitals, 14 are still standing. You still have the refugee or quote unquote contraband hospital uh, and the officers' hospital as well. Um, so I actually I have some slides I can share with you. Um, yeah. Do you, hey, do you guys have as you're doing that? Go ahead. Um, sure. Do you guys have a, a walking tour booklet or a walking tour around these things? Or so we do. Uh, we do provide uh, ranger guided programs. Um, you know, we don't necessarily uh, base them around just the hospitals normally. Um, Boo! Kinda. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I do like to include them as I'm going along. Uh, one of them, actually, I'm going to show you here in a little bit, uh, is, is perhaps one of my favorite hospitals to talk about uh, in the downtown area. And you'll see why here shortly. Um, let me. And while you're bringing that up, we also have another question from the comments from Mike. Uh, he wants to know um, where Confederate POWs were treated on Hilton Head. Were they treated at the same hospital as Fort Wells? I will admit that I'm unsure of. I apologize. I'm not sure if Confederate POWs were treated. Can you? Yeah, uh, they, I, I would imagine if if they were, they they might have been treated and then sent away, you know, either in the beginning paroled. I don't, you know, most most of the time, I got to imagine they didn't want to be stuck with them, you know, either side in the beginning. Let's see here. Okay, so first off, I want to give a shout out to Sam Cooley. Uh, without him and his photographers, we would not have contemporary photos of the hospitals that were established in Beaufort. Um, you know, this is the photographer for the United States Department of the South. Um, he actually was from Connecticut, and he had come here toward the start of the war uh, and established a photography, excuse me, photography studio um, across the street from where I'm sitting right now. Um, you know, he initially went to different camps in the area, and he would basically offer his services for some of money, but eventually was asked to travel with the army. Uh, basically between Charleston and Jacksonville and photograph as much as possible. And of course, among those photographs uh, exist uh, these depictions of the hospitals as they appeared, as they were occupied during the Civil War. Is there and, a centralized place online where you can, you know, rifle through his collection? Library of Congress. Awesome. That's you, you talk um, about wasting days, a wonderful waste of days is the library. I do that a lot. You have to keep in mind, sometimes they are mislabeled. So I, I had to do a little bit of homework on a few of these. Okay. Um, and, and I only know just because I, I walk these streets all the time. So you can see what, what is and what isn't. Right. Um, and one of the, the best resources that we have is this map. So this is actually a wartime map of, of downtown Beaufort. So you kind of get a sense of, you know, when I said it's not a huge town, a, a huge amount of space, this, this is what we're looking at. Um, the streets you can see are labeled differently than they are today. Um, you know, the streets that are run uh, vertically are, are numbered and the ones that are horizontally are lettered uh, huh. because this, this allowed uh, U.S. troops who are occupying the area to kind of know where they're going. Um, they don't know the local names of the streets. Uh, but you can see all the hospitals that are uh, dotting the landscape here. Uh, you have a key up in the left-hand corner um, showing you the different hospitals and of course it shows you the different outbuildings and stuff like that that are are being used as, as part of these um these hospital establishments um, so it looks like a total of 16 or more yeah so you see the chief uh, medical office down in the bottom right hand corner um not necessarily included as part of the hospitals um uh, but yeah there's there's 15 hospitals plus you have the like i said the contraband hospital as well um, 
There's actually we do have another uh, question in the comments about these hospitals. Um, Arlene wants to know, on average, how many beds were in each hospital? It varies. It depends on the size of the house. Um, the guys that are basically calling the shots on what homes are, are taken for use as hospitals uh, are the guys that are part of the U.S. Tax Commissioner's Office, uh, which is also in downtown Beaufort. Um, basically, all this, all this property you see here that was abandoned by plantation owners. Um, you know, this, this will all be taken by the federal government as this is declared an insurrectionary district. And this land is going to be redistributed by the tax commissioners. Um, and, you know, of course, they're gonna, they're gonna take what they need first, you know, what the government needs. And one of those things that the military needs, especially is hospital space. So they're gonna mm -hmm. pick some of these, these large homes in downtown Beaufort that have great ventilation, uh, for example, uh, ample uh, ample space, and that's they're going to use as hospitals. So it varies. I mean, it could be you know 15 hospital beds to 30 hospital beds or more. Um, there's there's no no set number necessarily. There's a really good resource, um, you know, in in one of the local papers, the Free South newspaper, in July of 1863, after the Battle of Fort Wagner, um, where they actually list specifically the patients that are in each hospital they know of and how many hospital beds are available in each facility. Do they list medical personnel in that resource as well? Yeah, they, awesome. uh, they they'll, you know, they'll usually throw out like uh, Dr. Durant or, um, you know, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bundy, things like that, but they'll, they'll list somebody at least. Yeah. Cool. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of what this downtown area looks like, I actually want to share with you a firsthand account. Um, and this is from a, a teacher uh, who came here fairly early on named Harriet Buss. And uh, I want to give a shout out here to Dr. Jonathan White, who um, just in the last year published uh, Harriet Buss's letters. Uh, and she actually worked out of the Mission House in downtown Beaufort. Um, and she gives us a pretty good idea as to not just what the town of Beaufort looks like when she arrives, but the island of Port Royal where Beaufort is situated. Um, so real quick, I'm gonna share this with you. She says, uh, Port Royal Island is about 12 miles in length and from three to eight in width. Beaufort is a city on the Eastern side of it. And, it, and in this city were the residences of some of the most aristocratic families of South Carolina. Northerners occupy them now. The secesh people left the island soon after the capture of Hilton Head and our troops have held this and the neighboring islands ever since. Charleston is about 30 miles from here in a right line, and we expect to hear the bombardment from there when it comes, and it will probably begin ere this week closes. There are five or six hospitals fitted up in this city. So this is written in uh, April of 63, so this is still fairly early. And many of the wounded from Charleston will probably be brought here. Should the carnage be great and these hospitals be filled with wounded, I presume, the Northern ladies here would nearly all enter that department. We teachers hold ourselves in readiness for this work, and I should think there might be 50 ladies right at hand for the duties beside the regular nurses. The hospitals in this department are under the superintendence of Mrs. Jean Davenport Lander. So she, at that point in time in 60, early 63, you have yeah, five, six hospitals established, and of course, um, as necessity dictates, you know, as, as you have engagements like Fort, Fort Wagner, of course, you're going to need some more hospital space after that. All right. And we have another uh, question in the comments, <clears throat> excuse me, from Lynn Bristol, a longtime supporter of our museum. Uh, she says that Major General Ormsby Mitchell was an architect of the Port Royal experiment. Did he orchestrate caregivers from Pennsylvania to deliver some medical assistance? You mentioned all these people coming south uh, to help out. Uh, do you know anything about that? As a Pennsylvanian, I should know that, um, uh -huh. but no, I don't. Um, you know, of course, Ormsby Mitchell, as head of the Department of the South, e even though very short-lived uh, head of the Department of the South, um, you know, of course, he uh, is kind of overseeing the establishment of Mitchellville, what will eventually become known as Mitchellville on Hilton Head Island. Um, and of course, I, I imagine there's some medical facilities established there, but as far as bringing Pennsylvanians down for that specific purpose, uh, under Ormsby Mitchell, I'm I'm unsure about that. I have just an observation. I think you know describing how people responded to come and help is definitely a lesson for today. 
you know, um, to to become involved and to go out and to to meet the crisis is just always impresses me uh, in these medical stories. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you had, uh, like I said earlier, um, a lot of abolitionists in these northern cities saw this as, you know, event an event to rise to the occasion, you know, kind of put their money where their mouth is, yeah. uh, you know, talking about helping uh, enslaved people or formerly enslaved people. A lot of them kind of jump at the idea to come here um, to to establish these schools, to um you know, work with these freedmen's communities and churches. Um, so yeah, that's that's a big part of the Port Royal experiment as a whole. Cool. Well, we talked uh, a lot about the people coming south. We do have a question also about some of the locals here, uh, also from Anna. Uh, were the hospitals returned to their original owners after use as a hospital? Sometimes. Uh, so as I mentioned before, um, the tax commissioner's office, the U.S. Treasury Department is overseeing this whole operation. Um, they're the ones that dictate, you know, who, who's going to be in charge of this property. Of course, um, you have one of the reasons this park exists here that we say reconstruction begins here is because for the first time in their lives, a lot of African-Americans have the opportunity to, to purchase and own property. Um, and, and in a lot of cases, property that was owned by their former enslavers, um, you know, they're, they're working for wages here. Of course, um, property that was confiscated by the federal government from people who abandoned that property is going to be auctioned off. And of course, they're going to jump at the idea to buy that property. Um, you know, the, the former landowners were given a chance to come back and, and, uh, and pay delinquent taxes in their property to retain ownership. Um, but I think only out of 200 plus plantation owners on these sea islands, maybe 12 come back during the war to, to pay taxes. Um, and after the war is over, you know, of course, um, some of this property now belongs to uh, the African-American community that were once enslaved here. Um, and, if, and some people just moved on. A lot of people left the area and moved to other places. Some do come back. Um, some people do eventually uh, move into the homes they abandoned uh, when they're able to, to uh, pay the taxes, delinquent taxes in that property. So the stories vary. Um, not everyone comes back and lives happily ever after in the, the homes that they left. In some cases, they do. I believe uh, one of the one of those cases is actually uh, Dr. Joseph Johnson, who um, had had his house built in circa 1860. So maybe maybe the last mansion built before the U.S. occupation of Beaufort, uh, and it's going to be used as Hospital Number Six for the 54th Massachusetts in July of 1863. Cool. All right, so real quick, I want to share with you uh, some of these photos of uh, um, some of these extant structures. One of them being, I mentioned, the, the, the contraband hospital, the refugee hospital. Now, uh, when U.S. troops arrive in the area, of course, like I said, there's thousands upon thousands of freed people uh, that come flocking into U.S. lines. You know, initially you have these people who live on these sea islands, but as uh, word spreads that there's a federal presence on these islands. Of course, thousands more start to flock in from the mainland. Um, they self-emancipate and and move toward um, a place where they can kind of you know start new lives free. But of course, uh, one of the things that comes along with this is you know when you have people like I said earlier congregating in this one area, uh, sickness runs rampant, and and you know they have to establish these these hospitals as a result. One of them is this contraband hospital. This is actually um, just about two blocks from where I'm sitting in downtown Beaufort. So this is one of those homes that you can see really hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, and among the people that work here uh, during the war is Harriet Tubman. Um, of course, she comes here fairly early on as well. Um, you know, some of the people that might have been treated there are people from the John Joyner Smith plantation in Port Royal, where Camp Saxton eventually will be established. Um, this was a 700 acre plantation on the, the southern tip of Port Royal Island. There's at least 80 people enslaved there. Um, and this is actually a, a wartime photo. I, I believe it might have been taken by Sam Cooley um, of, of some of the people from the Smith plantation. Uh, and, and of course, these are some of those people that U.S. troops would be referring to as, quote unquote, contraband uh, upon their arrival here. 
Um, and of course, you know, as I mentioned, Harriet Tubman's work uh, here in the Low Country is uh, one of the things that launches her to uh, to a point where we all know her name. Um, she, you know, of course, worked on the Underground Railroad in the pre-war period, um, but uh, in early 1862, she's actually given a written pass from Governor Andrew of Massachusetts to uh, come here to South Carolina as part of this port oil experiment. Uh, so she brings her skills with her, whether that be uh, serving as a scout and a spy or um, or as a nurse. And, and often a lot of people remember her for um, for what she did for not just soldiers, but for for freed people, um, including uh, Dr. Henry Durant, who's acting assistant surgeon of the, the contraband hospital in Beaufort. Uh, in fact, a couple of years after the Civil War is over in 1868, they're trying to secure a military pension for Tubman. Uh, and he actually lends his testimony to her work in Beaufort. And so that's what I have uh, shared here. Awesome. Uh, one of the other hospitals, uh, hospital number 10, is, is argued to be the first uh, hospital established for African-American soldiers in April of 1863. Um, and so this, it actually consists of two, I believe, two facilities. Um, this one that I'm showing you now, this is actually part of the University of South Carolina Beaufort campus today. Um, this was part of Beaufort College in the pre-war period. Um, so this is a library building. Uh, and it actually served as a, a freedman school during the war. But later on, uh, this will actually be taken uh, for use as part of hospital number 10. Um, here in the picture on the right hand side, this is one of those Cooley photos. And you can see uh, the African American students of, of this freedman school. So this would have been taken likely uh, before, uh, before it was actually taken as a US Army hospital. Um, and then, of course, the kind of the main uh, hospital building was the Elizabeth Barnwell Guff House, which is just a, about two blocks away from uh, from the library. And uh, and head of this hospital, and, and you all might be familiar with with her work as well as Dost, Dr. Esther Hillhawks and her husband. Um, and she actually she wrote a great account uh, of her time here in Beaufort, where she talks about the establishment of. Um, USCT hospitals, you know, of course, she's one of these abolitionists that comes here uh, fairly early on. Uh, and she talks about the establishment of this hospital in April of 63 under the charge of her husband um, in one of the Barnwell mansions, which if you ever visit the area, they are a, a plenty. Um, but she talks about, you know, how these homes have been kind of left destitute. Um, basically, they have to uh, uh, kind of get down scrubbing on their hands and knees to get this place ready for patients to actually start arriving. Um, so uh, let's see here. Speaking of uh, all those hands needed for help, we have another question in the comments yeah. from Arlene. Uh, did newspapers publish reports of these hospitals far and wide for people to know that they could come and help out? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I know that you know locally the in the Department of the South, of course, uh, Rufus Saxton, who's military governor, uh, basically says that people who are living in this area, if you're going to live in this area, uh, you have to dedicate uh, three days of your week to helping out in the hospitals. Of course, many other people um, outside of those three days decide to dedicate their time. But as far as uh, enlisting help from outside sources, uh, having these uh, accounts published nationally, I'm unsure of that. Um, you know, of course, a lot of people knew in Boston and New York City uh, and in Philadelphia that they could come down here as part of this Port Royal experiment, uh, whether as teachers, doctors, nurses, et cetera. Um, outside of those major cities, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, it's interesting to think, you know, texting of the day was really the old fashioned handwritten letter, you know, right. um, and then you know, the folks are communicating with people back home. They're putting, you know placards up and and you know small little posters of of you know that three-day requirement maybe posting it in a local newspaper so while while news traveled it definitely i mean it definitely traveled it just the the pace was uh, of the 1860s and, rather than today and a lot of it's by you know by word of mouth you know this i always kind of liken this area to to this national stage where you have all these really significant figures coming through um, people like Harriet Tubman, people like Clara Barton or uh, Susie King Taylor. Um, 
And of course, a lot of these folks are well connected and they pull those connections in when they see this worthy cause. You know, for example, um, Rufus Saxton, who's a native of Massachusetts, is, is an abolitionist. Um, when he sees that there's a need for a commander for the first South Carolina volunteer infantry, someone who has the best interest of formerly enslaved men in mind, he reaches out to Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who is a staunch abolitionist from Massachusetts as well, who had been uh, part of what uh, the press dubbed John Brown's Secret Six. Who better to head up this, this regiment of formerly enslaved men? Um, so people just know where to go uh, when they're looking to enlist that help. Um, yeah. You know, they have they have somebody in their little black book they can they can call up or you know write a letter and enlist their help here uh, as the poor will experiments getting underway. Yeah, it's fascinating the, the, when you have something like that going on and 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 the the just caliber of people who are coming to participate. It's you know for for Clara Barton to befriend Francis Gage there and and certainly they interacted there, correct? Um, yes. Yeah, because I would I would I would love to have been you know at a dinner party with with those two and Harriet Tubman. I mean, can you imagine? Right. And, and, you know, Clara Barton is a, an understudy of, of Gage here. Uh, she looks up to her. Yeah. Um, you know, they'd worked together on, uh, on Paris Island, of course, and, and in Beaufort. Um, I believe they, they likely encountered each other actually at this home. I mentioned before the Joseph Johnson house. You know, he's one of these people that, that comes back after the war's over. Um, this home is, is in basically the same condition it was in, say, 1863. Uh, and this is actually the hospital I mentioned earlier, where the the wounded of the 54th Massachusetts are taken after the fight at Battery Wagner. Um, this is actually just down the street from our our visitor center in Beaufort. Um, uh, and of course, you know, if if I'm sure a lot of people who are watching, I'm sure I'm sure you guys have seen the movie Glory, right? Um, you know, one thing that they don't depict on screen in the in the motion picture is what happens after the fight at Battery Wagner. Um, but the story that happens after the attack, after Robert Gould Shaw is killed in battle, um, is just as fascinating. Um, you know, these guys are all, all the wounded that are able to make it back to federal lines are actually brought here to Beaufort to recover. Um, you know, this, uh, this excerpt actually was written by uh, Lewis Douglas, the son of Frederick Douglass uh, on July 20th, the day that guys are actually starting to arrive after the battle. Of course, the battle took place on July 18th. Uh, and he's writing to his wife and he talks about some of the men um, that are coming, uh, that, that likely are coming to Beaufort as uh, some of the, the wounded. Um, I can, I know that uh, two of these guys uh, are actually going to, to die actually they, after they arrive in Beaufort. Um, I know they're both, I believe, buried in Beaufort National Cemetery. And one of them in particular, Charles Reason, I think I've seen you guys share his story before uh, on your, your social media platforms. Um, I have a great account that I'd like to share with you here in a little bit. Uh, he's not taken to hospital number six. He's actually taken to, uh, to hospital number 10 and treated by Esther Hill Hawks. Um, and so uh, real quick, I'm going to pull out account here. You know, this, like I said before, um, a lot of the guys that are treated in these hospitals in downtown Beaufort are, are, are sick, uh, you know, as this place is run rampant with disease. Um, you know, you, of course, have some battles here in the Department of the South, nothing on the scale of, say, Antietam or, or Gettysburg and Manassas, something like that. They're usually smaller scale battles. Um, but one of these first battles that really sticks out in the minds of people that are in this area uh, is the Battle of Fort Wagner, as not only the men of the 54th are brought down here, but um, soldiers from nine other regiments that attacked the fort on July 18th, 1863. Hey, so, what's the distance? What's the distance from Fort Wagner to where you're at? As the crow flies, about uh, 60 miles or so. Wow. So they, to get the wounded there, had to be a couple day trip even by Wagner. So, so the fight is, is the evening of July 18th, and the guys start to arrive here on July 20th. Okay. Um, and of course, they're, you know, they're all put on a, a transport, the Cosmopolitan. A hospital transport, uh, and they kind of circle out the coast and come back here into Port Royal Sound. Yeah, because um, they, they they weren't they weren't being transported by crows, right? Yeah, <laughs> now that we we haven't uh, developed that technology quite yet. Yeah. 
We got a uh, another interesting question here. Since we mentioned uh, the 54th Massachusetts, made famous by the movie Glory, has the popularity of Glory helped or hindered your interpretation of Sea Island medicine? Honestly, it doesn't. It helps get people interested. Um, as far as medicine goes, uh, it, honestly, we don't get a whole lot of questions about medicine. I'm sorry, David. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but like I said, it's, it's one of those things that it, it draws attention to the story. And of course that can be said for a lot of movies and books. Uh, and then as historians, we can kind of take it from there. So, yeah. um, cool. but I, I, I mean, almost everyone's seen glory, um, so I, I think it definitely has kind of helped actually drive. Sometimes it helps drive track, traffic into this area, at least yeah. for people who know the story. Um, but real quick, I just want to share this this uh, account with you from uh, Esther Hill Hawks, who's at hospital number 10, uh, when she talks about the friend of Lewis Douglas, Charles Reason. Um, she says, we now have a small hospital fund to supply us with the many little comforts necessary to our patients, and most of them are easily satisfied. Many have died. Several cases of gangrene have been provided for in tents. Two severe amputations today, neither surviving but a few hours. One of these, a boy hardly 20 years old, Charlie Reason, formerly a slave, but of late years resident in Syracuse, New York. I have taken a great interest in, he is such a noble looking fellow and so uncomplaining. So grateful when I bathe his head and face as I sat by him holding his one poor hand. He said in reply to my question of why he came to the war, I know what I'm fighting for. Only a few days, a few years ago, I ran away from a man in Maryland who said he owned me. And since then, I've worked on a farm in Syracuse. But as soon as the government would take me, I came to fight, not for my country. I never had any, but to gain one. My mother died years ago. And father, I thought was your father, I thoughtlessly asked, forgetting the peculiar relations between father and child in this part of the country. The hot blood throbbed up into his face, but he only said, my mother was all I had to love me, and she has gone home, sweet home. I shall see her soon. I'm glad to go home. And of course, we know that, uh, unfortunately, Charles Reason does not make it out of hospital number 10. Uh, wow. Today, he's buried in Buford National Cemetery. Yeah, uh, But he's uh, one of these guys that, that, that Douglas lost touch with after the engagement, not knowing that he was sent to Buford. Yeah, those uh, the letters, man. Golly, you know, it's just it takes you right there. And it's and it's easy to kind of imagine this landscape with these firsthand accounts with, uh, you know, um, of course, thankfully, we have several newspapers here in Beaufort that are run by um, some northerners as well. In fact, right near the wharf where the Cosmopolitan shows up on July 20th uh, is um, you have the uh, the Free South newspaper office right there on Bay Street witnessing the cosmopolitan pulling up with the wounded of the 54th um and so they give a really good account as to uh you know people um, both black and white rising to the occasion upon the arrival of the cosmopolitan that had come here from charleston harbor which you can see depicted on the right hand side um people aligning along new street this picture on the left here um you know waiting to help carry these men up to the hospitals you know on july 20th these guys are are hobbling up New Street if they can, uh, being carried. Of course, there's ambulances that are crowding the street. Um, it's you know, and just looking at it now and uh, and reading some of these firsthand accounts, it's it's not too hard to imagine perhaps what it looked like on July 20th, 1863, as the men of the 54th uh, processed up uh, New Street and uh, headed toward hospitals number six and number ten. Um, and, and I'm assuming, you know, today it's modern pavement. Were, right. were the streets uh, paved back then for the day or were, were they dirt? Uh, from a lot of the photos, photos, dirt roads or sand, of course, uh, since since right. you know, we're right here in the islands. Um, you had a there was one main highway that ran between Beaufort and Charleston. It was called Shell Road or now known as Old Shell Road. Uh, it was basically that it was crushed shells lining right. the road from Beaufort to Charleston. Cool. And that, that route still uh, exists today. I think it's, it's highway 21 now or 17, sorry. Um, but uh, 
So there's actually, I want to share this account with you from the newspaper, the Free South, who witnessed the arrival of uh, the 54th Massachusetts right here uh, along Bay Street. Um, they actually say Sunday, uh, Sunday last was a sad day in Beaufort. The arrival of the Cosmopolitan with the wounded from Morris Island, bringing also intelligence that our brave troops had been repulsed in the assault upon Fort Wagner, cast a gloom upon, upon the community. As the vessel neared the wharf with its freight of suffering, a silent, mournful concourse gathered around the landing, eager to lend a helping hand in removing the wounded to the hospital. As those were, who were able to walk filed off the boat and wended their slow way through the crowd, the scene was truly pathetic. The wounded of the 54th Massachusetts came off the boat first, and as these sad evidences of the bravery and patriotism of the colored man passed through the lines of spectators, every heart seemed to be touched. And we'll vouch for it that no word of scorn or contempt for black soldiers will ever be heard from any who witnessed the sight. Wow. And so, of course, this leaves a lasting impact, uh, not just on the local community, but a lot of people who, um, you know, a lot of these these reporters who are witnessing uh, this situation unfold. Um, mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, waiting for them down the street, you have people like Charlotte Fortin, of course, she's. Uh, teacher at Penn School on St. Helena Island. Uh, she's actually the first African-American teacher at Penn School. Um, also, she's a, she's a Philadelphian, but also uh, had spent some time in Massachusetts. And, uh, and she knows some of these doctors that are going about town. Like, uh, I'll talk about them in a bit, but Dr. Seth Rogers, the first South Carolina. She's a well-connected um, member of the community. She actually comes from a staunch abolitionist family. And so when she gets the chance to help out uh, some of these black soldiers who'd come off the line from Fort Wagner, uh, she jumps at the idea. Um, and among the soldiers she's treating is actually Sergeant William Carney, pictured here on the right, who's wounded three times in action, uh, but also uh, ended up saving the colors of the 54th Massachusetts. And uh, he's actually taken to hospital number six as well. Cool. Well, that uh, ties in with a question we have in the comments, uh, sure. again from Arlene. Um, we're Surgery is done in specific hospitals or in all hospitals as needed. From the accounts that I've read, all hospitals as needed. Um, you know that, like I said, that newspaper account that I I mentioned before that shows all the uh, the the number of beds, the the names of the wounded. They also describe in several uh, on several occasions the amputations that are being performed in in some of some of these hospitals too. Uh, and almost all of them that I've I've researched uh, had uh, surgeries being performed. That'd be interesting for us to to um, dive down that rabbit hole to figure out, you know, in in Nashville in particular, you know, different hospitals had different specialties. You know, we talk about that system developing. It'd be interesting to to dive into that rabbit hole about about Beaufort Beaufort to um, find out. You know how come they were kind of all sort of operating independently in that in that way, right? Um, but I, it to me it what jumps out is it might be because it was so far from these battles and so hard to get to because if you were going to amputate you wanted to do it you know within twenty four hours best case scenario so it might be that they were performing them you know right then and there knowing you know if if you're going to get shipped we got to get you going right. take two days to get there well and you know in this particular case with. Uh... Uh, the fight at Battery Wagner, of course, the fight takes place on Morris Island. U.S. troops have established hospital tents on on Folly Island. Um, so I'm sure there's some some amputations and procedures taking place on Folly. Um, but a lot of, you know, this is think of these islands here as a bubble. Once you go on the mainland, uh, it's a different story. There, there are still uh, Confederates, you know, in the countryside. Um you know, they have this little pocket of islands that they're hanging on to uh, with about 13,000 people spread between, you know, around Edisto Island all the way down to, to Jacksonville. Um, you know, so all of the guys who are going to be wounded in action uh, in the, the general vicinity on the surrounding islands are going to be directly sent to, to Beaufort. And usually they can probably get here uh, within a day or less. Yeah. So I mean, have it, a, it seems, I'm sorry. 
Uh, we do have another question in the comments. They've been uh, patient for a while now, Mark and Sue. Uh, and you did kind of answer this earlier in the video, um, but I wanted to revisit it. Um, they have a great grand, great, great grandfather who served in the Civil War. Uh, he went to the hospital and they're wondering if there are hospital records uh, that are in existence today and how to find them. Uh, I know you mentioned that newspapers sometimes would do that. I'll say from a general experience outside of 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 uh, your area of expertise, uh, Civil War hospital records are not great and often non-existent, but it does depend very much on the hospital they went to. Yeah, um, so yeah, like I said, um, newspapers are a great resource, but also if you were to go through their uh, compiled military service report, um, sometimes in there, if, if they're wounded in action, it'll say you know what, what hospital, what general hospital they were uh, staying in. Aside from that, uh, you know, uh, maybe if you look through uh, pension records, for example, uh, those are the, the three best records I can think of off the top of my head uh, if you're looking for specific hospital records. Yeah, and I, I encourage Mark and Sue to um, reach out to our researcher here, Terry, um, through our website uh, and, and send as much information as you can. And she will certainly direct you to the best resources based on the information you give her. And that's that's why we exist. So please... Um, Go to our website, civilwarmed.org, um, and um, and and hit that research button, that that question button. So we got about ten minutes left. We might run over a little bit because I'm loving this, but um, <laughs> have at it through your slides there. Uh, okay. So of course we can't we can't move any further without talking about Clara Barton and, and Francis Gage. Of course, um, you know Clara Barton uh, and. Francis Gage both uh, oversee operation. Well, Francis Gage oversees operations on Paris Island. Um, she's overseeing the welfare of uh, freed people. Um, I believe it's about 500 people. Uh, so Claire Barton is actually going to to meet her down here um, when she arrives in 1863 as well. Uh, and both of these these ladies are also going to be um, servicing some of the soldiers of the 54th Massachusetts. I believe in Hospital Number Six. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, cause I think we were discussing before we got started, you know, Clara Barton, uh, when she comes here to the department of the South, um, I don't know if, if, if we, you know, necessarily consider her a staunch abolitionist, but what she sees here in the department of the South kind of opens her eyes to that world, especially through, uh, Francis Gage as they're discussing these ideas of, of emancipation, um, and kind of, um, the bigger idea of, um, you know, equality uh, as well, whether it be uh, racial equality or gender equality um, that she's discussing with Francis Gage. Um, so I won't go into to a whole lot about Claire Barton and Francis Gage here, but I just wanted to make a quick mention that they are, um, you know, in July of 1863, they are present at, at hospital number six as well. I'm um, taking care of some of these, um, these African-American soldiers at the 54th. Yeah, that's uh, another that's another topic just real quick that I think is worth exploring on our end because of the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office, um, you know, where she's that's her home base when she comes down here and you can visit that space, um, which is just incredible. But, you know, we get a lot of questions about her views, Clara's views on uh, slavery and abolitionism. And, and, you know, my comment is usually you know, she came from the area with her abolitionists. Um, she was kind of a, she was a believer, but she wasn't just totally, you know, an, uh, an evangelist about it. She, until that experience down there um, in, in your neck of the woods, where she actually sees um, the conditions and, and how they're treated. And that truly was a, a pivotal point, I think, for her. So cool. Um Another one right uh, actually not too far away from hospital number six is number seven, also known as title home. It was the Edgar uh, Fripp house. This is actually the home that will serve as a hospital for officers. Um, actually, quite a few of the guys from the, the 54th are brought here, uh, including uh, Edward Hallowell, who takes command of the 54th when Robert Gould Shaw is killed in action. Um, the modern photo I chose to use here was actually from the Big Chill. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I had no because, idea. And they don't, did they even reference it in the movie? Uh, I don't house? think so. Yeah, that's cool. Um, but, uh, you know, when a lot of visitors come to town, they're always looking for the, the big chill house. 
Um, like, oh, hospital number seven. So anyway, <laughs> nice. um, Jeff Goldblum, Pittsburgh royalty was here. Uh, <laughs> and of course, uh, this is Ed Hallowell that I just mentioned. Um, he's actually written about in, uh, in Charlotte Fortin's journal, which if you ever get a chance to read is a great resource. Um, not just for the content that discusses her hospital work, but also as a teacher on St. Helena Island. Um, you know, she she arrives here in the Department of the South in October of 62 and is here till about May of 64. Um, but there's a lot of great material in there. And of course, uh, she she was acquainted with Ed Hallowell before the war even started, um, both being Philadelphians. Um, and of course, she visited him in uh, it title home in hospital number seven. And, and this is kind of her reaction uh, to seeing him prostrate. Hmm. Uh, let's see. And of course, like I said, I'm going to flip through the rest of these just so you can see that I'm not lying. There, there are still quite a few of uh, of these hospitals still standing today. I will mention that um, pretty much all of them are private residences today as well. Um, so hospital number one, and these are all very close together too. While you're flipping through, we have uh, another question in the comments. I'm not going to be able to get to all the questions, I think, uh, but I am going to do my best. Uh, so please uh, be uh, uh, patient with me, everyone. But uh, Christina asks um, about the New South that you quoted from and uh, where there are any issues that are available for viewing. Are they digitized online? Are they in archives? There's honestly, so there's not a lot of uh, original copies of New South floating around, um, but there are quite a few copies that are digitized on if you have a subscription to newspapers.com uh, or uh, through uh, Chronicling America um, or uh, Library Congress. Those are probably the best places I can recommend to, to actually dig through the New South. And if you're really into learning about the Department of the South and early reconstruction here, um, you will spend hours upon hours upon hours digging through them. I know from experience. Um, so that's, those are the sources I could recommend to you there. Um, this one I, I want to mention real quick, just because this, this guy is pretty fascinating. Um, this is hospital number three, um, through which Dr. Ferdinand Hayden operated. Um, and, and this guy has a pretty interesting story. You know, he's uh, outside of being a, a surgeon doctor. He, uh, he's an explorer. So in the pre-war period, you know, he's, uh, exploring out uh, out west, out toward the Rockies. In fact, he, I believe, he travels with uh, with Governor K. Warren for a period uh, just before the Civil War. Um, but as the war ramps up, uh, he joins joins the army. Uh, and here at uh, at Hospital Number Three, he's going to be serving as a surgeon. This is actually one of those newspaper excerpts I was talking about that mentions the number of of hospital beds. Uh, they had forty seven beds in that house, um, and this is one of those cases too. Um, where they actually discuss, um, uh, you know, amputations. Um, but, you know, after the war is over, uh, for anybody who uh, who travels about to some of these Western national parks, you might have heard his name before. Um, as, uh, you know, as, as the war ends, um, Hayden eventually goes out west and he's exploring the Yellowstone Territory. Uh, and actually, it's a federally fun funded project. Eventually, uh, the one of the areas that he explores will take his name Hayden Valley. Hmm. So uh, he's he's probably one of the more well known surgeons that passes through Buford, even for a little bit of time. A couple more for you here. Like I said, these are all just blocks apart. This one actually, uh, hospital number nine on Bay Street will also be used as um, uh, headquarters for Isaac Stevens um, as he's in the area in, uh, in late 1861, early 1862. There's actually a really famous photo of him uh, and his staff. He's seated on the front porch of uh, the John Joyner Smith house. This is uh, hospital 11. This is also used for, for officers today. This is actually, this isn't, Necessarily privately owned. It's a uh, it's a bed and breakfast slash restaurant. When I showed you before um, the photo of New Street, where the men of the fifty fourth were transported uh, toward Hospital Number Six, this is the house that you saw on the left. This is Hospital Number Three, 
Um, this also would have been headquarters for uh, Rufus Saxton, the military governor of the Department of the South. And it appears by all these pictures that it's always sunny and 78 degrees down there in South Carolina. That's right. It's always sunny and 78. <laughs> of oh, course, San he, he Diego. Also... <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, the Sanitary Commission, of course, was operating here, too, uh, under the, the uh, direction of Dr. Marvin Marsh. So, you know, any any kind of supplies that couldn't, uh, you know, be be a. a Achieved through the federal government, this is kind of cutting through some of that red tape is this, this private uh, sanitary commission uh, supplying a lot of these hospitals with food and, and, and much needed supplies. Um, one kind of incredible thing, uh, especially in the, the wake of the fight at Battery Wagner, places like hospital number 10 and, and really hospitals all throughout town. Um, anytime these hospitals were in need of any kind of supplies, specifically locally grown food, a lot of the freed people on the sea islands, especially St. Helena and ladies, would be delivering cartloads of stuff into the town for soldiers. Mm. Um, so it, it kind of goes to show that not only people from, uh, you know, it's not just people from outside of the sea islands that are, you know, kind of bring these resources, but they're they're delivering from within. Um, you know, freed people, of course, uh, are are harvesting crops on their newly owned land that they're delivering to these hospitals free of charge. And one thing I want to discuss real quick too, and this, you know, this is one of the sites that we have within our park, um, is Camp Saxton. So this this photo is actually a Sam Cooley photo um, of about a company of soldiers from the First South Carolina Volunteer Infantry, all African American soldiers. Some of these guys were actually once enslaved on this land on the Smith Plantation, um, and of course, uh, when you have guys that are, are not just from South Carolina but all up and down the coast. Um, disease runs rampant in these camps, as you know. Um, and so they have a couple of people that are overseeing the welfare of, of these soldiers, including um, Dr. Seth Rogers, who I'd mentioned earlier, and Susie King-Taylor. And uh, if you haven't read it yet, Susie King-Taylor has a great memoir that she published in 1902, um, Reminiscences of My Life in Camp with the First South Carolina Volunteer Infantry Slash slash 33rd USCT. And uh, she's fairly young when she goes in camp with the first South Carolina. She's uh, about 14, 15 years old. And, um, you know, she is, uh, you know, serving as a nurse, as a teacher. Of course, she's literate. Um, and she writes about all this later on um, in the early 20th century. Um, Dr. Seth Rogers, of course, he, um, you know, he has these letters published by University of North Florida um, that are an excellent resource as well. He actually talks about establishing a hospital on a cotton gin um, close to the Beaufort River in Camp Saxton. Hmm. And quick um, plug, Susie King Taylor's book is very good and you can get it in our gift shop, another way to support us. And I, that was one of my beach readings uh, two years was it? ago. Yeah, it's, it's a great book. It's a wonderful resource. Um, so, and, and I, I have a bunch of other firsthand accounts I can share with you later on, but I know that we're kind of running short on time, so I won't eat up uh, any more of that. Well, my, um, my question about medical care in camp, were they vaccinating smallpox there or, or anything? Smallpox, I'm unsure, but Susie King-Taylor does actually uh, mention uh, vaccinations. Uh, yep, they do. So she says, I was not in the least afraid of smallpox. I had been vaccinated. And I drank sassafras tea constantly, which kept my blood purged and prevented me from contracting this dread scourge. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, my, uh, I, I highly recommend sassafras tea. I grew up on it. My dad used to grow it and, and make it, which was kind of cool. Um, and I do recommend vaccinations as well. <laughs> but again, not a medical doctor. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, you know, that's that's something that even to the post-war period, uh, you know, Susie King Taylor continues to to serve as soldiers uh, as one of the founders of her chapter of the Women's Relief Corps in Boston. So this is something that starts in 1862 and really lasts the rest of her life. Yeah, and, and to kind of conclude here, because we could go on for another hour, so we'll have to we'll schedule another one here um, for for later in the 
well next year uh i think would be great but um you know we talked a little bit about as soon as you know when the war is over uh the army pretty much packs up and leaves is what you were telling me and and the kind of the infrastructure of the the hospital system just kind of disappears with the exception of the ones that were treating contraband and freed slaves and and you know they don't just pack up and leave right away of course you have you know this occupation during early reconstruction you have teachers that remain in the area for years after the war into the 1870s and beyond i mean penn school operates till till the 1940s so uh, you have a lot of these people who came here and found a purpose, and they actually stick around for a very long time after the war is over, even after the U.S. military pulls out. Yeah, it's one of those things that, you know, when people ask about the impact of the Civil War, you know, slavery is the obvious. Um, but I always include, you know, the role of women because they're left on the home front to take care of businesses, to take right. care of farms, and then it transforms the medical aspect. But it also physically and and forevermore um, transforms these towns and these cities uh, because of the impact. Um, so it's it's just amazing, um, a, amazing time period in American history. Absolutely. So, hey, in, in closing, Rich, and again, this is awesome. I knew it would be. Um, and. Um, I'm glad I finally got over the fact that you only work for us for a day and a half, which makes this <laughs> this show possible. Um, but uh, tell us, you know, when when I go places to see museums and and destinations that I've never been to, it's always good for me to know. All right, how long did I plan on being there? So, like, if we're coming to your your place, how long should we plan on visiting? Because some places it takes a couple of days, some places right. it's a couple of hours. Well, like I mentioned, uh, we have the three sites that we operate here, um, and we do offer ranger guided programs. So, uh, and usually it, it varies on who you get and what they want to talk about. It could be anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. Um, I usually say safely to kind of get the full experience. You need probably, if you're going to see everything, maybe four hours. If you can cool. dedicate four hours to seeing all that. And of course, you could spend much more time, but right. yeah, three to four hours. So in the downtown area, I'm assuming like there's restaurants and stuff. So like you mm -hmm. plan a day and and break it up with lunch or a happy hour or something. Absolutely. There's, you know, down on, on Bay Street, of course, you have a lot of the restaurants and bars and such right along the riverfront, along the Beaufort River. Um, you know, my uh, my girlfriend and I walk through the town of Beaufort a couple of times a week um, just because, I mean, it's such a beautiful space. And, you know, when you know the history behind a lot of these these buildings and spaces, uh, it makes it a lot more impactful. And I want you to send my empathy to your girlfriend for all of your your trips. <laughs> There's all civil. Everything I see on your social media is civil war oriented. And that poor girl, man. I, <laughs> she knew what she was getting into. And you know, we're, right. going on, we're going on four years. So I haven't messed up too bad. All right. Good. Good. <laughs> well, listen, thank you so much. And uh, Kyle, if you want to close us out. And uh, again, just a, a, a great talk. And um uh, we'll, we'll definitely do it again. Absolutely. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We had people visiting or uh, streaming in from Ohio, from South Carolina, from here in Maryland, uh, even Canada. So glad to have all of you uh, join us today. Uh, again, if you enjoyed this video, consider supporting us in the membership link down below. Um, I am happy to say that during this, actually, we got an update on our ambulance wagon, which is currently being restored in South Dakota. Uh, they finished the wheels on that, so expect an update on that in the near future. Uh, and that's supported by members like you, by donations, by the generosity of people who enjoy our content and want to make sure that this story continues to be told hold. So again, thank you all for joining us uh, and stay tuned for our next program to be announced. Thanks again for joining us, Rich. I uh, hope you had a good time and look forward to hosting you again in the future. I had a great time. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. And uh, be sure to follow us on Facebook, TikTok, all the stuff that we do. Thank you again, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day.